Hello, and welcome everyone to BioRad's webinar series on Droplet Digital PCR. This is our second webinar in a series of six BioRad will be hosting on DDPCR. My name is Mohini Patil, and I'm the Global Product Manager for Droplet Digital PCR at BioRad, and your host for today's webinar. First, let's discuss the webinar logistics. The webinar will last approximately one hour. Dr. Don Shelton will present on DDPCR and its application in cancer and liquid biopsies for about 45 minutes. Following the presentation, we will have 15 minutes of live questions and answers with Don. Throughout the webinar, feel free to use the Q&A box on the left-hand side of your screen in order to submit your DDPCR questions directly to us. We will get to as many of your questions as we have time for. However, if we cannot get to your question today, we will personally follow up with you over the next few weeks. Also, if you have any technical difficulties during the webinar, please use the Q&A box to report them. Now, a little bit about our speaker, Dr. Dawn Shelton. Dawn earned her PhD in Oncological Sciences from the Huntsman Cancer Institute at the University of Utah. Dr. Shelton has investigated different aspects of the WINT pathway in colon cancer, studied the origin of different subtypes of breast cancer, and examined uterine cancer in a clinical cancer research lab. Don is currently a senior scientist at BioRad's Digital Biology Center, focusing on developing applications and collaborations for droplet digital PCR in the cancer field. The title of the talk this morning is Applications for Cancer Using Droplet Digital PCR. Without further ado, let's get started. Don? Thanks, Mohini. Hi, my name is Don Shelton. I'm one of a team of scientists that have been hired by BioRad to help translate Quantalife's droplet digital PCR technology into interesting and exciting new applications. When I heard about the new technology a couple of years ago, I quickly realized that it had the potential to address some of the many pain points I've experienced in my own research. I'm here today to show you some of the applications we and others have developed. As was mentioned in the first webinar of this series, we consider digital PCR to be the third generation in the evolution of PCR, moving from qualitative results to absolute quantitative measurement. In real-time PCR, the effects of inhibition, either by primer efficiencies, template matrix, or chemical inhibitors, are always a concern. Any cause for delays in CQ values alters, fundamentally, the accurate measurement of the template, leading to greater errors. With droplet digital PCR, each droplet is thermocyclic to endpoint individually, and read as either a positive or a negative for the target of interest, hence the term, the digital aspect. Shown here is the standard workflow. We take a typical 20 microliter reaction, partition the reaction into about 20,000 droplets, run the plate in a standard 96 well thermocycler, and then read each droplet in a flow cytometer-like fashion. So how does partitioning actually improve sensitivity and reproducibility? For example, partitioning serves to make a target of 1 in 10,000 background molecules into a relative ratio of 1 in 3. In the 1 in 10,000 situation, or bulk as we call it, the target signal will be swamped by background signal. After partitioning, the target is now one part in three, and its signal will be clearly detectable. This target enrichment is particularly useful in rare event detection like cancer mutation detection and SNP detection, and in cases where the amount of sample is extremely low. Since we operate at low copies per droplet concentrations, we can use Poisson statistics to correct our concentrations based on Poisson's law of small numbers. According to Poisson's law of small numbers, if there is a random distribution of quantifiable independent events, predictions can be made about the likelihood or probability that these events will occur. Thus, a Poisson distribution can be used to determine the number of template molecules in a droplet and how likely it is that 0, 1, 2, or 3 templates exist within each droplet. In the case of sample number 2, where there is a low concentration of templates, shown are six green circles. 
the correction factor is very small, shown in red, 6.2. At higher concentrations, like in sample number four, the correction factor is larger. We count 70 events, positive droplets, apply Poisson, and the correction is now 96 positive droplets. To orient those of you used to thinking about DNA in terms of mass per unit volume, 33 nanograms of human genomic DNA is roughly equivalent to 500 copies per microliter, or 10,000 copies per 20 microliter reaction, shown by the star. This guideline makes some assumptions. A, that we are using human DNA, that the DNA is in a fairly pristine condition, and that we are assuming one copy of a gene per haploid genome. Based on these guidelines, in an ideal world, the very best sensitivity you could hope to attain is 1 in 10,000, or 0.01%. If you can't read 10,000 events, you cannot attain a 1 in 10,000 sensitivity. In clinical and translational research, the patient sample is typically the matrix. This presents some unique challenges to PCR-based methods. Fixed formalin, paraffin, embedded tissue samples are the norm. The fixation process itself damages nucleic acids and adds greater variability to the results. The high precision in template partitioning compensates for this variability in template, generating high-quality data. One holy grail in medicine is to develop the liquid biopsy that is to take blood or some other non-invasive liquid sample and run tests that are sensitive enough to detect a variety of characteristics. ZDPCR is currently being used to examine tumor heterogeneity, clonal evolution, metastasis, and cell of origin questions in basic research. In translational and clinical settings, ZDPCR is being used to monitor the development of drug resistance post-cancer treatment, identifying alternate druggable targets, new arising mutations, prevent over-treatment, and measure doses, doses and responses in gene therapy treatments. Rare cancer mutation detection is currently the most common method, and it is used to test prognostic and predictive indicators, monitor residual disease, and to pre-select patients into clinical trials. Another area of research that's very hot right now is the copy number variation studies. These are becoming more common. So let's talk a bit more about the different methodologies that are being used. When we talk about cancer detection and PCR, most folks immediately think of cancer mutation detection or rare mutation detection. These sequences are typically have high homology between the mutant and wild type probes, usually just a one base pair difference. The template is generated by the same PCR primers, and the signal of interest is usually in terms of some fractional abundance of mutant and wild-type background. However, to, due to the emergence of next-gen sequencing data and other technologies, whole new realms of study are now being examined. One hot topic is copy number variability. Digital PCR is ideal for studying copy number variations in large populations, either people or cell populations. With easy duplexing of target and reference assays and high statistical confidence within one well, copy number analysis over multiple regions is quick and affordable. This and higher order multiplexing will also be discussed in greater detail in the next webinar in the series. Another emerging use for precision DDPCR is absolute quantification of enzyme activity. Rather than using page gels and radioactivity, digital PCR can be used to measure absolute counts of a template that has been acted upon by some nucleic acid interacting enzyme, like restriction enzymes, ligases, or polymerases. A more familiar application for PCR in general is gene expression analysis. Digital PCR removes variability in expression due to dilution series curves and also is superior in measuring small amounts of transcript, like the expression of stem cell markers in a heterogeneous population of other cells. Other applications that will be discussed in detail further into the webinar series are easy linkage analysis of two targets and haplotyping or phasing of two targets with multiple alleles, determining whether the alleles are in a cis or trans conformation. 
All the aforementioned methodologies are currently being used to interrogate cancer. This is a short list of some of the tools we are offering, with many more on their way. We have fully wet bench validated rare mutation detection assays culled from the COSMIC database, which can detect down to 0.1% mutant in one well. If further sensitivity is required, we just add more wells and sensitivity increases. The main limitations to sensitivity are assay specificity and sample availability. In addition, we currently offer about 400 copy number variable targets with more in development. So let's talk about rare event detection in cancer and finding the needle in the haystack. This is an example of data with the KRAS G12 assay. For RMD work, we recommend several no template controls shown on the left to determine reagent or handling contamination issues. We also suggest wild type only wells to test for the false positive rate of the assays and set thresholds. And then finally, also a mutant positive control, so you can see where your mutant positive signal would be. Each dot represents a single droplet. Along the vertical axis, you see the FAM positive droplets at various fluorescence amplitudes in blue, indicating the endpoint nature of the experiment. On the horizontal axis is a cluster of single positive droplets in the hex channel, containing the wild type template in green. In the upper right-hand quadrant of the rightmost panel, you can see a curve of brown droplets representing the droplets containing both a wild type and a mutant template. And finally, the black cluster of droplets in the lower left-hand corner are the double negative droplets containing no template. Typically, the Quantisoft software will cluster your droplets according to these four clusters and colors. This is a dilution series of mutant KRAS G12A spiked into wild type from 3% to 0% mutant. As you can see, we have tight error bars down to 0.475 copies per microliter. In order to gain greater sensitivity, I would just have to add more replicate wells. In this case, I had three replicates. The error bars you see are actually 95% confidence intervals. At the lowest levels of detection, we also account for stochastic and subsampling error. This is the same data, but viewed in terms of fractional abundance. We demonstrate sensitivity to at least 0.01% in only three wells over a three-fold dilution series. The false positive rate for the assay is shown in the wild type sample and is over an order of magnitude lower than the 0.01% sensitivity shown. To demonstrate more sensitivity, you would only need to add a couple more wells to each sample below the 0.01% mark. And as I said, this is a three-fold dilution series, and the numbers, if you look at the, at the chart, are 3.2 and 1.05 and 0.326. Our R-squared value is 0.9939. It doesn't get much better than this. The sensitivity of a method determines how early some mutations can be detected, and its accuracy will determine how efficiently one can monitor the progression of the disease. The this is some early unpublished work we produced in collaboration with Helen White's lab at the National Genetic Reference Laboratory in the UK. We examined a wide number of samples provided by the NGRL against multiple common cancer-related mutations. FFPE sampling is a routine method of fixing biopsy samples, which allows hospitals to preserve a lot of biological information, such as protein content and structure of the tissue. However, FFP is also very destructive to the nucleic acids. This has been a point of difficulty for current technologies like qPCR. Being able to accurately quantify rare mutations in samples containing less or damaged DNA is one of the main advantages of DDPCR. These samples were actually um, leftover samples that they had that they didn't have enough sample to run by other methods. So we examined about 150 patient samples, which were analyzed by DDPCR for several cancer mutations. Many of the KRAS, G12, 
G12A, G12C, D, R, S, and V, BRAF V600E, and EGFR T790M and L858R. On the graph shown here, the sample number is shown on the x-axis, while the percentage of mutant is shown on the y-axis. The sensitivity of the QX100 system allowed us to work with limited and extremely variable amounts of FFPE samples. The 96 well format of the QX100 also allowed for high throughput, providing rapid, simple, and accurate quantification for the clinicians and researchers involved. Here we show additional data from the same collaboration demonstrating detection of JAK2 from 95 plasma samples. The samples were also pyrosequenced for comparison. The first chart shows the agreement between pyrosequencing and DDPCR in determining mutant abundance. In a world of perfect agreement, all the data would fall on the 45 degree line. The data here are in excellent concordance, even down to the low end of the scale. The second chart shows the three examples of a patient sample that were called negative by pyrosequencing, but were shown by the sensitivity of DDPCR to actually have low levels of mutant JAK2 present. One sample is at 0.12% and the other two are at 0.02%, or one mutant in the background of 5,000 wild-type molecules. We demonstrated that DDPCR is more sensitive, more rapid, and less costly method of screening for rare mutations than pyrosequencing. So another hot area of research in the cancer field is interested in this circulating tumor cells. So we've looked at using DDPCR to contribute to the study of circulating tumor cells. We collaborated with a company called Fluxian, shown here, and examined their isoflux system, which uses microfluidic flow channels, a magnetic field, and antibodies to enrich for the selection of various circulating tumor cells. They have the ability to switch up which antibody is used in their, selection, their CTC selection process, enabling more flexibility for researchers. The enriched CTCs can be recovered from the isoflux system or any other cell enrichment system and then examined by DDPCR. Fluxian sent us 14 samples, all of which we were blinded, but number 16 and number 17 as controls. The cancer cell lines were spiked into blood, run through the isoflux system for recovery, shown in the rightmost column and then purified for genomic DNA. In parallel, some samples were spiked in without the isoflux enrichment. So while the isoflux samples, they had, three, they had two samples of uh, 10 cell spike ins, for in, instance, they actually had three initially. They took one sample aside, examined it by um, fluorescence in situ hybridization, and counted under a microscope four cells. So it's an estimated number of cells recovered post isoflux enrichment. So in this demonstration, we were asked to use the KRAS G13D assay, shown here as a five fold dilution series from 5% mutant down to 0.007% with a sensitivity between 0.02% and 0.6. The R-squared value, as you can see, is 0.9965, so we had excellent linearity, and our false positive rate was about 0.06, shown here in the green line. So, so our absolute sensitivity was somewhere between 0.02% and 0.06%. The genomic DNA was isolated from both the isoflux system enriched and unenriched samples and were tested by DDPCR for KRAS G13D mutation detection. Isoflux enriched sam spike samples were positively detected by DDPCR containing G13 mutations. In contrast, the G13D mutation was not detected in unenriched matched cancer cell spiked blood samples above the false positive rate. 
So while we were able to detect positive signal, we were not able to detect above the po false positive signal of the wild type only control. This test was performed in four wells. The false positive for the, this assay was zero, as I mentioned before, 0.06% cutoff. And while it is possible to detect spike in cells, you would need, need, to uh, need at least tenfold more wells for each sample and probably more to compensate for the false positivity of this assay. While we detected both the 10 and 20 cell spike ins clearly, they were not statistically different from each other. However, there was a clear separation statistically between the 10 and 20 cell samples and the 100 cell spike in samples. As I mentioned previously, another field of study quickly being adopted with the advent of whole genome data is the study of copy number alterations or variation. Roughly 12% of the genome was found to be copy number variable in the normal population. These variations may be caused by duplications, deletions, inversions, or translocations. In addition to small regional ch changes, entire chromosomes may be deleted or duplicated in disease states. Germline variations might lead to susceptibility in disease or adverse reactions to certain drugs. In cases post-onset of cancer, the cancer process itself acts like an accelerated genetic selection process similar to evolution but on a cell-by-cell -cell basis. This somatic expansion and selection process results in a survival of the fittest cancer cell race, leading to many somatic copy number alterations and genomic imbalances. The implications of all these variations are not currently well understood. One example would be copy number variability in the gene CYP2D6. CYP2D6 is a liver-expressing cytochrome P450 enzyme involved in the metabolism and elimination of about 25% of all clinically prescribed drugs. It is also a copy number variable gene with varying allelic frequencies within distinct ethnic populations. Shown here are nearly 300 HapMap samples from the Thousand Genomes Project, including 96 British, 120 Kenyan, and 72 Mexican samples. The reference assay that was used was RPP30. The Mexican population shows a substantially higher frequency of individuals with a CNV of 3, about 12.5% versus 1% for British and 5% for the Kenyans. This genotype confers a higher rate of metabolism for a broad range of drugs and other xenobiotics, which can have significant pharmacological consequences for those ultra-metabolizing individuals. With digital PCR, large, large populations of samples can be profiled for copy number status of a gene of interest in a very quick and economical way. This demonstration was performed with about 300 samples, one well per sample, and one person in one day. As you can see, the error bars derived from even one well in this kind of experiment are extremely small. These kinds of results allow for estimations of population-specific allele frequencies. In this paper, with a collaboration from a researcher at UC Stanford, at Stanford University, these researchers were looking for FGFR2 amplifications in FFPE tissue of gastric and colorectal cancer tumor samples. FGFR2 codes for fibroblast growth factor receptor 2, which is a potential therapeutic target in cancer. Several small molecule FGFR2 inhibitors are currently in development to target cancers with amplifications of the FGFR2. The ability to accurately quantify the number of copies of FGFR2 in FFPE tumor samples will help with identifying patients who are most likely to benefit from these particular inhibitors. The authors describe the technical problem. Quote, current detection methods include real-time PCR, high-density array comparative genomic hybridization methods, single nucleotide polymorphism or microarrays, and fluorescence in situ hybridization. While these approaches have generally performed well, they are handicapped by the issues of sensitivity of detection, end quote. Also, genomic DNA extracted from FFPE material is often of poor quality. 
therefore analysis of FFPE derived genomic DNA using standard PCR based or microarray based assays for genomic amplification can be te technically challenging. In this sample of data, they looked at the copy number, um, which is estimated by taking the ratio of FGFR2 positive droplets to the number of reference gene positive droplets and multiplying by a factor of two for a diploid ge genome. A titration of cell line DNA was harboring an FGF R2 amplification with increasing amounts of normal genomic DNA demonstrated that genome amplifications can be reliably detected with DDPCR even in mixed cancer and normal cell populations. The researchers further examined 21 FFPE samples from gastric and colorectal tumors and five matched normal samples. They identified FGFR2 amplifications in two FFPE samples in diffuse gastric cancer by DDPCR, which is the more aggressive form, and were able to identify amplified FGFR2 in a mixed cell population. They did not see any amplified FGFR2 in the colorectal tumor cell lines and samples that were their controls, and FGFR2 is not known to be amplified in colorectal cancer. The DDPCR results were highly concordant with results for the, from the SNP arrays. Another difficulty in cancer treatment is that a single tumor can contain multiple clonal populations that can be missed in a single site biopsy. Testing DNA in plasma from the blood will help overcome this by testing all types of DNA present in the body. However, the plasma DNA mutations and amplifications will be present at extremely low levels. Having the ability to inexpensively and non-invasively detect either mutations or copy number variations will enable close monitoring of the disease in the individual. This includes early monitoring to show responsive drug treatment and frequent sensitive screening for recurrence. Shown here is a paper demonstrated detection of the HER2 amplification from the plasma of breast and gastric cancer patients. The results were compared um, with FISH testing. The DNA was attained by taking blood samples which contained cell-free circulating tumor DNA. Identifying a good reference assay for a non-variable re region or gene in cancer is probably the most challenging aspect of this type of study. Once this work was obtained, they were able to reliably detect HER2 amplifications in cell line controls and patient plasma samples. Identification of HER2 amplifications can lead to an effective treatment of breast and gastric cancers using Herceptin. Another area of interest in the search for cancer biomarkers in blood is microRNAs. This group measured six microRNAs by quantitative PCR and digital PCR in a dilution series of both water and plasma and found detection of by DDPCR to be more precise than qPCR. Shown here is some of the data. In figure A is the DDPCR dilution series in water. On the right is the same dilution series performed in qPCR. Though both show excellent linearity and detection, DDPCR demonstrated far less variance. This means that fewer experiments, fewer wells, less sample overall, and less cost is needed to perform the same experiment. In panel C, the advantage of this precision is demonstrated by examining patient plasma samples for the microRNA MER144. MER144 has been found to be elevated in the serum of advanced prostate cancer patients. Performing the experiment in DDPCR allowed for clear separation of control from case samples with statistical significance that was not seen in standard real-time PCR. Another application being developed that we believe will benefit from precision measurement is the measurement of enzyme activity. Telomeres are the protective repetitive sequences at the end of chromosomes. These ends naturally degrade with each passing cell division, usually losing 25 to 200 base pairs per division. Once this gradual shortening reaches a critically short stage, estimated around 200 to 300 base pairs, 
the cells arrest and become senescent or old. Telomeres can be thought of as a cellular or mitotic clock. Once the clock has wound down, the cells either die or pass through crisis. Activation of telomerase, a a reverse transcriptase enzyme, can lengthen the telomeres, enabling continued cell proliferation. Telomerase activity is found in fetal and adult stem cells, germ cells, and cancer. Greater than 85% of all tumor types re-express telomerase. The telomerase repeat amplification protocol, or TRAP, measures the presence of active telomerase by measuring the activity of the telomerase enzyme on a starting template, TS, which is then amplified by PCR. The current most sensitive method of detection still uses radioactivity and laborious page sequencing gels to quantify telomerase. Initially, a crude lysate is made of the cells to be analyzed. A template primer is added for 30 minutes, allowing telomerase to add hexameric repeats to the template. Small aliquots of this lysate are then added to a PCR reaction containing the TS primer and the ACX primer. The ACX primer consists of a four hexameric repeats with three base pair mismatches and a non-complementary anchor to the end. Shown here are the 2D plots of the TRAP assay in digital PCR. On the far left, we display the no template controls, or NTCs. In the middle is the amount of positive droplets seen with 0.8 cell equivalents in, of 293T cells in the reaction, denoting the number of extended templates created by telomerase. On the far right is data for 100 cell equivalents, a little bit more easy to see, of telomerase extended templates. In the TRAP assay, there are a lot of intermediate fluorescence amplitude droplets, what we call RAIN. RAIN is typically seen when, for whatever reason, the endpoint PCR efficiency is not 100%. However, since we are a digital system, the PCR efficiency is less important, and as long as we can threshold based on the controls, a positive is a positive event. In this case, a significant cause of the raininess of this assay is, high, is the highly repetitive nature of the template and the primers. So in collaboration with a researcher at UCSF, I developed Digital Trap. We set up two series of experiments as proof of principle. The first experiment was with cancer cell lines HeLa and 293T, the most commonly used reference cell lines for the assay. Our collaborator made cell pellets of either cell line, made lysates of those pellets, and performed the extension reactions, where telomerase was added to the repeats of the TS template. These samples were then made into five full dilution series, each from 100 cell equivalents down to 0.8 cell equivalents per well. In the second experiment, we wanted to examine the activity of telomerase in normal cells and we purified immune cells from two patient blood samples, split them, and made two series of dilutions from 2,500 to 625 cell equivalents and 500 to 125 cell equivalents. Immune cells have remarkably low levels of telomerase activity and typically require about 10,000 cells in order to be measured by standard methods. Shown here are the results of the TRAP assay in total copies measured per microliter lysate. As you can see, our error bars are extremely tight and the results are linear. We can also easily measure the activity of one cancer cell. Here is the same data converted into units of telomerase, where one unit is defined as 1293T cell. We can easily discriminate the activity of one cancer cell with excellent R-squared values. But what about normal cells rather than highly expressing cancer cells? So the immune cells were purified from blood, counted by tripan blue exclusion, and lysed in a 1x chapped buffer. Two different samples, A and B, if two-fold dilutions of the cell lysates are shown. Again, we are seeing excellent linearity and separation, even down to 0.1 units of telomerase in 625 immune cells. We also have clear separation between our controls and samples. So just to push the system a little bit further, we looked at five-fold lower concentrations. 
The same samples as previous from another set um, were, were further diluted five-fold to push the sensitivity down. Inactivated samples are extracts heated to 95 degrees for five minutes and used as controls. As you can see, we're starting to see a little bit of overlap between our inactivated control negatives and the error bars of our lowest sample, uh, B125. Part of this is due to subsampling error. The number of, uh, the number of counts that we are uh, counting at this point is extremely low, and so subsampling and stochastic error plays a larger role. But the linearity is still look excellent, and we are measuring below 0.1 units in 250 cells. To decrease our error bars, we'd only need to increase the number of wells. So these exact same samples were run on gel trap as well in parallel. As you can see with the stars, aside from the labor and time intensive problems of gel trap, the NTCs commonly show positive signal. That calculation of the dilution series performed led to between 21 and 24 units per 10,000 immune cells in sample A and three to four units in sample B. This is close to the results for the gel trap method. Although the higher false positive signal from the NTCs, the results are compressed. Digital trap is a sensitive, fast, and high throughput method for testing telomerase activity that does not require handling radioactivity. So here is a list of some of the digital PCR publications currently out referencing app applications in the cancer field specifically. This list is also download downloadable from the ON24 site with other support notes to assist you in the more hands-on details associated with the data in this talk. Thank you for your attention, and I'd like to open the talk for questions. Thank you, Don, for your very engaging talk. As a reminder to everyone, please use the Q&A box on the left-hand side of your screen to submit your questions to Don. If you would like a copy of today's PowerPoint presentation, a copy of the QX200 Droplet Digital PCR brochure, relevant posters, tech notes, and a list of the cancer publications Don just showed, they are available at the link to the left of your screen for download. The webinar is also available on demand within 24 hours. If you would like any additional information, please feel free to reach out to your local BioRad Droplet Digital PCR specialist as well. Don will take questions now. So Don, our first question is, uh, in your experience, have you come across genes that have shown a 0.5 CNV value, such as 1.5 or 2.5 versus a full integer 1.0 or 2.0? And if yes, uh, what assay design measures have you taken to overcome this? Um, I've definitely seen those kinds of results. Uh, typically, if you are confident that your assay is actually very good, so um, most of that kind of work as far as determining actual C and D and assay specificity, we perform in-house on our validated assays. However, so most of the time when I see it in my own work, it has to do with the fact that the population is usually either heterogeneous, so it's a mixed cell population. You might find too many wild type cells with a small percentage of a cancer, uh, a cancer population. So if you can determine that concentration, you can back calculate, or if you can't determine that concentration, you can go back and try to um, extract out just uh, a sample that has higher, uh, higher percentage of tumor. The other issue is that uh, you might be um, seeing results where your reference uh, assay has become copy number variable, which in cancer will sometimes happen. So sometimes when I do see that, I will uh, test with yet another reference assay and see uh, if the two results correlate, because the, it's somewhat unlikely that the copy number variation of your reference assay will happen exactly the same way with two different reference assays. Thank you, Don. Uh, next question is also regarding copy number. Uh, what sample prep can be used to look at copy number, and can protein interference be diluted out without treatment? Uh, let's see. 
For sample prep, I mean, there's a lot of different ways that we have processed our uh, genomic DNA for copy number variability. Uh, the most common and, and probably one of the most simple versions is the DNA Easy Kit. Um, I do believe there are several uh, FFPE associated kits that have some kind of um, DNA healing properties that have also been used. Uh, but as far as diluting out protein, it really hasn't been too much of a problem at this point. Okay, thank you. Um, now moving on to questions regarding liquid biopsies. Uh, do you have any information, experience, or publications that you can reference on RNA uh, gene expression from liquid biopsies? Oh, um, yeah, so further on in our uh, webinar series, another person will actually be covering RNA gene expression. Uh, but as far as papers referencing RNA sequencing off the top of my head, um, I don't have that, but it will be in the publications list that's associated with the webinar. Um, a regard, question regarding assay design. Uh, what is the difference in pro-prima designs between qPCR and droplet digital PCR? For the most part, there's very little difference between uh, qPCR and DDPCR assay design, most, um, and when I say most, I'm talking like 80, 90, 95% of the assays that we've tested from qPCR work perfectly fine in digital PCR. The only thing that's different is that in digital PCR, you actually can see how your assay behaves in a much more um, discriminating way. And so you, have, you might have had an assay that showed 100% efficiency or 0.9% efficiency in qPCR. In digital PCR, you'll see what that translates to. So a lot of times we'll see that the fluorescence activity of our assay is not as high as it can be. And that, that tells us that you might want to optimize your assay a little bit more to get better efficiency. Our next question is regarding input sample DNA. Uh, it's a two-part question. So the first part is, what is the total input DNA quantity for your plasma experiments? And the second part is, how is the DNA concentration quantified? Um, so total input for, uh, it's somewhat based on, um, if you look back to the slide, uh, can I go back to a slide? If you go back to the slide that talked about uh, DNA concentrations, the total input is roughly around, um, I believe it was 300 or so. But very rarely are you ever going to see that much DNA in a plasma sample. Um, yeah, maximum that we should load of genomic DNA has typically been about 350 nanograms per well. Um, but, I mean, the likelihood of getting that much genomic DNA from a plasma sample is really, really, really small. So, and then the second part of your question is how to quantify. So we typically will do, um, you'll read the copies and then go back to that calculator and then the calculator will give you a fair estimate of how much, um, how many, how many copies and how much nanograms that is. So you get a, let's say you get that 500 copies per microliter reading off of QuantiSoft, that back, that tells you there's 10,000 copies. And at 3.3 picograms per haploid genome in, uh, in human samples, that translates back to your 33 nanograms. So keeping to the topic of assays, uh, you mentioned rain in your presentation. Could you comment on the different causes um, of this rain? Yeah, certainly. So rain is an interesting thing. Rain is one of the ways that we can tell that the assay or the template is not performing ideally. So lower amplitude fluorescent droplets indicate that there's a lower PCR efficiency and a lower endpoint fluorescence. You'd see that on qPCR at the very end of your reaction when the lines are actually at different, differing levels. So rain to us just indicates that there's some problems. Now we do see rain at a higher level in highly degraded samples, 
uh, DNA samples, RNA samples, FFP, whatever. We'll also see rain if the assays are not really ideal. So we've seen a lot of rain in microRNA assays. And part of that is just there isn't a lot of design you can do on microRNAs because it's a 21 nucleotide or 18 nucleotide template. So actually creating an assay to target that is a very difficult thing, and you don't have as many options. And so sometimes you will see a lot more rain for those kinds of, those kinds of assays. So Don, we have a follow-up question for the input DNA from plasma, and um, we want to know what is the minimum amount uh, that can be detected in your experience? Ah, well, the minimum amount is purely based on how many copies you expect in your genome. So let's say you have um, 10 picograms of DNA. The, by calculating the size of your genome uh, for a human, for instance, at 3.3 picograms, point, uh, 10 picograms should only get three positives. And we can detect it all, and we see it all the time. The only problem that you have is at that level, there's a lot of stochastic or subsampling error. If you take 10 mils of blood out of a person and you and you put it into your DDPCR and you get three three positive droplets, the problem is that that 10 mils of blood that you took from the body is still a very large. It's a subsampling of the body, and so sometimes you'll see zero, sometimes you'll see one, and with some Poisson error corrected, subsampling error corrected frequency, you'll see three. So the next question is regarding uh, the enzyme assays. So you mentioned one type of enzyme assay. Uh, can other enzyme assays uh, be done utilizing this DDPCR technology? Absolutely. So something that we've been working on a lot in-house has been um, just identifying what enzymes perform ideally um, and how well they perform in, in digital PCR. So we've been measuring the activity of many of NEB and associated companies' enzymes and seeing after a half hour what percentage of their – what exact percentage of their – um, template is left uncut, and after an hour, what percentage is left uncut, and how well does the enzyme perform? Other kind of assays that we can see fairly easily would be ligation assays, where you wanted to find out whether or not your ligation worked or not. If you had primers across your ligation point, then you could PCR it up and actually read that you have a positive template. You're getting one ligation in your reaction, you're getting 100 ligations in your reaction, or you're getting 1,000 ligations in your reaction. So you mentioned uh, blood. Um, are there any special precautions that need to be taken for handling blood samples for DNA isolation for droplet digital PCR? Um, aside from just good clinical practices or good handling practices where you'd want to use a BL2 hood, the only other thing I could suggest is current, current sampling um, uses mostly vacutainers, which are okay. Um, if, they're, if they're handled correctly, if they're stored recently, if the plasma is purified relatively recently. But in a hospital setting, a lot of times um, when when things get busy, these things will sit on a counter for four to six or eight hours kind of thing before they're processed properly, and that can lead to some degradation of your sample. So what we have found are these Streck tubes. Um, there's a paper out on those, and they actually have demonstrated for the case of handling samples, shipping samples, that up to two weeks the Streck tubes show no degradation. And so if you're going to be doing something, uh, setting up a clinical study, setting up a study that involves looking at things like microRNAs or something that's very, very small amounts of sample to begin with, with very close reading of, of discrimination, then I would recommend using some, and, and you can prospectively set this up, I would recommend switching to a Streck tube for, for greater sensitivity. So thank you, Don. Uh, our last question for today's webinar is, uh, is further validation needed beyond droplet digital PCR? Well, it depends on the kind of experience, the kind of experiments you're doing. So if you, I think one of the most common applications in general for digital PCR right now is people have been spending a lot of time looking at big data, NGS data, and, and associating them with disease states by QTLs, by SNP arrays, that kind of thing. And I think um, 
we are going to be the main validation tool for those kinds of studies because we can discriminate five, six, seven copy number variable regions and one and two copy number variable regions much, much easier than qPCR. So yes, I think validation is always important. However, um, if we are validating, uh, if we're validating an NGS platform, then I, I don't think there's further validation necessarily needed. If we are, with, if we are the first line, I would say just by good uh, scientific practices, of course, anytime you can validate, it's better. Okay, and actually we had another question come in uh, regarding the plasma samples uh, with low DNA yield for rare mutation detection. Um, is preamplification advisable? Oh, that's a tough one. So what we see at the cutting edge of the field right now is a general distrust of preamplification, and this has less to do with what kind of read of, that we get um, and more to do with contamination problems that, that labs are very concerned with and also the fact that the enzymes and the buffers and the assays being used in all of these preamplification protocols have certain error rates and certain biases. And it's very, very hard to control for those biases. Some of them are fundamentally biased in one nice general direction and you can correct for it. But a lot of them have a much more stochastic or um, uh, probability-based error rate. And the problem with that is you can't compensate. So although I think a lot of people are going to try it and, and are trying it, most of the people that we've met that are trying it have been going back to digital PCR on the straight uh, sample because uh, the results just have better precision. So once you preamp something, the error just naturally grows. Well, thank you, Don. Uh, that was our last question for today's webinar. Thank you, everyone, for attending the second BioRad Droplet Digital PCR webinar this morning. We have four more webinars in the coming months, so please participate in the full webinar series. As a reminder, today's webinar will also be available on demand within the next 24 hours. For those of you who had questions we were not able to get to today, someone from BioRad will follow up with you in the next few weeks. For more information on Droplet Digital PCR and educational resources, visit www.biorad.com forward slash webinar. This URL is displayed to the left of the slide in the resources box. Thanks, and have a great rest of the day.